Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to be talking about how you regulate enzyme activity. So we're going to focus on two things primarily. We'll look at what allosteric enzymes are, and then we're going to look at inhibitors of enzymes. So we'll look at the two types of inhibitors, competitive and non-competitive inhibitors. So let's start by looking at allosteric enzymes. Now, for this, I need to draw a very simplistic diagram. I want you to imagine that we have a initial substrate. So let's say that this is IS, our initial substrate, and that gets turned into, let's say we turn that into our intermediate product, A. So this one is intermediate A. So what I'm doing here is putting in a sequence of stages in an enzyme catalyzed reaction. Then let's say that that then takes us to this product here, which is intermediate B. And then finally, what we do is end up with let's say this in green, which is our end product. So what we've got is a reaction here where we've got a substrate, it's turned into intermediate A, then intermediate B, then an end product. And at each stage, we're going to use an enzyme. So I want you to imagine now that we've used this point here, enzyme 1. At this point here, to go from intermediate A to B, we've gone to N, or we've used enzyme 2. And then finally, we've used enzyme 3. Now, enzymes inhibited by the end product of a reaction are called allosteric enzymes. That's where this term comes from. So, the end product can actually go to inhibit the enzymes in the reaction itself. So for example, this end product here, and we say that this is inhibition. This is what we're referring to. So we're saying that enzyme 1 is an allosteric enzyme. It can be inhibited by the end product of a reaction. Now, allosteric enzymes have more than one binding site. So they have the active site for the substrate, but they also have what's called an allosteric site, which is the binding site for an end product. So in a previous um, video, I've drawn a rough sketch, let's say of an enzyme just like this. Let's say, just for the sake of argument, I'm just gonna draw a rough, just for diagram purposes. Of an, so here we've got an enzyme. This part here, I've said in the previous video, is the enzyme active site. Now what we're saying is, that there is a region, so it could be here for example, there is a region called the allosteric site and it's that that the end product would bind to. Now when that happens the enzyme structure is altered and when you alter the enzyme structure the substrate is less likely to bind to the active site. I said in a previous video that enzymes are substrate specific. They have a very sort of predefined shape, if you like, and that active site will only fit one substrate. So by changing the shape of the whole enzyme, by binding the end product to the allosteric site, you can no longer now have a substrate bind to the normal enzyme active site. Now, this is reversible. When an inhibitor actually detaches the enzyme, it goes back to its original conformation. 
So it is possible to remove whatever is binded to that allosteric site so that end product can be released from that allosteric site and the enzyme will go back to its original conformation. Now let's think of the advantage of doing this. There is, there is one key advantage to using allosteric enzymes and that's it you get an element of control. You can control the reaction when there is an excess of end product. So this is an example of negative feedback. I'm just gonna make a note of that because it's really important. This is an example of what's called negative, and that's a shorthand symbol for negative, negative feedback and that's crucial to understand so if you have this substrate at the top so I'll just draw a number one here so let's say we've got this substrate here then we form number two the intermediate a number three intermediate b and then our end product number four if we have too much end product too much number four being made as a result of this process then we can take that end product and if we've got an allosteric enzyme for enzyme one or even enzyme two, let's say, or three, we can stop and regulate this process. We can regulate this reaction. So that's a little bit about how we regulate enzyme activity via allosteric enzymes. They are enzymes inhibited by the end product of the reaction. Now let's look at inhibitors. Because inhibitors are chemicals that can reduce or prevent the activity of an enzyme. And this is a clear way of regulating their activity. And there's two that we tend to look at, competitive and non-competitive inhibitors. So what I've got here now is the definition at the top for us to look at. So inhibitors, reduce or prevent the activity of an enzyme, and a few notes about the two things I've just referred to, competitive and non-competitive inhibitors, which I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to draw a little a diagram in the empty space here. So first of all, let's, let's just draw this diagram and then I can explain its, its relevance. I'm also going to give some examples of both types of inhibitors. So I want you to imagine on the bottom, on the x-axis of this graph, we've got substrate, I'll put conch for concentration, substrate concentration, and up the side we've got V for velocity, and we'll put max here. So this is rate of reaction, V max if you like, or reaction rate. Now, normally, so just with no inhibition, we'd get something that looks a bit like this. So this is our normal without any inhibition. So as you increase the substrate concentration, the rate of reaction increases up to a point and then it plateaus. Now, with a competitive inhibitor, you get something that looks a bit like this. I'll stick to the blue and red colors to make it easier. So this blue line represents a competitive inhibitor. Now, with that competitive inhibitor, what we find is that we get the same, it's called V max, so it reaches the same maximum rate of reaction. But we get a different, so I'll put diff, we get a different what's called K with a little M, which stands for the Michaelis constant. Now, the Michaelis constant refers to the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate. So it's, if you like, how, how easy it is for that substrate to bind with that enzyme. And this is with a competitive inhibitor. Now, that's because... So let's explain why we get the same reaction rate, but a different kind of affinity. Competitive inhibitors are chemically similar, similar to the substrate in the reaction. So that's this first point we've got here. So I'm going to tick each one as we go through. So the substrate that we're using is chemically similar to our competitive inhibitor. And so this competitive inhibitor would compete for the active site. 
the inhibitor can bind and it can prevent further substrate from actually binding to the active site. But if we increase the substrate concentration, the effect of the inhibitor is reduced. So that's why we've, with this blue line on the graph, we've got the same Vmax. We can still reach the same maximum rate of reaction. It's just that the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate is reduced because we've got this competitive inhibitor there. So this competitive inhibitor joins to the active site or binds to the active site because it's similar in shape to the substrate and reduces the overall rate of reaction unless we increase the substrate concentration. Now that is slightly different for a non-competitive inhibitor. So let's draw this on the graph. This red line represents a non-competitive inhibitor. Now for this we can quite see, clearly see that, well, this has the same Michaelis constant, the same affinity for the substrate with this enzyme. So in this reaction, the enzyme can still bind to the substrate with that same affinity. But what we notice is that Vmax, so our, our maximum rate of reaction is reduced. So we can't achieve the, the maximum rate of reaction. So let's think about why. Non-competitive inhibitors, in terms of shape, are not similar to the substrate. They're not chemically similar either. So they don't actually bind to the active site. Non-competitive inhibitors bind to another site on the enzyme. And now they change its conformation or shape and could stop it from working. So when in the previous sort of aspect of this video we were looking at allosteric enzymes and we said that the end product binds to a site on the enzyme that's not the active site, the same applies to this. Non-competitive inhibitors don't bind to the active site, they bind to another point on the enzyme. And when that happens, they could change the shape of the enzyme and stop it from working. Now some enzymes remain inhibited even if you increase the substrate concentration. So that is why the red line on this graph, if you like, plateaus much sooner. The rate of reaction is, from then on in, reduced. You cannot reach the maximum rate of reaction because non-competitive inhibitors can still inhibit the enzymes even if you try to overcome that. So the enzyme has the same affinity for the substrate, it's just that you've inhibited a lot of that enzyme. So the key things to remember, competitive inhibitors are ones where they are chemically similar to the substrate and bind to the active site to block it. Non-competitive inhibitors are not chemically similar to the substrate and bind to other sites on the enzyme, and not the active site, and thus can have a much more noticeable effect on the rate of a reaction. So let's finish by thinking about some examples of inhibitors, because I think that's important to include. So let's start with competitive. One example of a competitive inhibitor, and I'll write this nearby, is something called prontosil. Now prontosil is an antibiotic, and it works by inhibiting synthesis of folic acid in bacteria. Prontosil binds to the enzyme that aids in the production of folic acid. And so the bacteria dies. So prontosil, this antibiotic, is given, binds to the enzyme that is normally involved in producing folic acid. And so the bacteria dies. Now our cells, our animal cells, aren't damaged because we get our folic acid from food. We lack the enzyme that produces folic acid and the drug just generally has no effect on animal cells. But when we give this competitive inhibitor, this prontosil antibiotic to bacteria, it inhibits the enzyme from producing folic acid and so bacteria would die. Now in terms of a non-competitive inhibitor, the best one that I can think of is actually cyanide.
Now, cyanide, if we go into specifics, actually attaches to sulfur groups and it can destroy disulfide bridges. Now, what it does is change the tertiary structure of enzymes. So it said that non-competitive inhibitors can already change the shape of enzymes. Cyanide changes the tertiary structure of the enzyme. Now, it changes that active site. Now, the effect of that is massive. If the active site becomes changed and cellular respiration is disturbed because the process of respiration relies on a variety of enzymes, then energy would not be released. You'd have no ATP being produced. So this non-competitive inhibitor cyanide can actually damage the enzymes involved in respiration. As a result, you get no energy being made. And if cyanide affects too many cells, the actual organism can die. So there's a good example of a non-competitive inhibitor. So our competitive inhibitor is prontosil, and non-competitive is cyanide. And work by two different mechanisms. So in this video, we've talked about allosteric enzymes and inhibitors, both ways of regulating enzyme activity. Okay, hope all that helps.